Honor to the Most High God for the Holy Sabbath. Blessed be His Holy Sabbath. He's going to get straight on into it. Go, go to John 1 and 1. Get straight off into it. Straight off into it. John 1 and 1 says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. So we see that it says the beginning was the Word. So let's go look at the beginning. Let's look at Proverbs 8 and 22. Well, hold on. Let's go to Michael 5 and 2 because he had me open up straight on to it. So we're going to start this year. Because we all, everybody knows who this is talking about. I say in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So we're just going to try to confirm these things. Michael 5 and 2. He said, But thou, Bethlehem Arapta, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth have been from of old, from everlasting. So let's look at Matthew 1, because this says the going forth of the ruler of Israel is going to come out of, uh, he's going to be born in Bethlehem, which was a major contention among those during the master's time, because this is what the scripture said. Now, Matthew 2 and 1. This is what it says. Now, when Yahshua was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east of Jerusalem, saying, Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east, and are come to worship him. So, they said, Where is he that's king of the Jews? So, we you know, when he said ruler of Israel, is that not signifying this man will be king of the Jews? Okay. So when Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. And when he gathered all the chief priests and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where the Messiah should be born. So King Herod went to the priests and said, well, what does scripture say he's going to be born? He said, and they said, they said unto him in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet, and thou Bethlehem in the land of Judea art not thou the least among the princes of Judah? For out of thee shall come a governor that shall rule my people Israel. So he used governor instead of ruler. So hold Michael 5 and 2, because we're going to come back. Let's look at Isaiah 9 and 6. Matter of fact, we're going to start a little higher than that. We got this not too long ago, but now we're just going to deal with it in a different fashion. And we might come back to Isaiah 9. We'll see what the Lord got us done. He said, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. And of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it, to establish it with judgment and with justice from henceforth even forever. The zeal of y'all who shall perform this. So instead of using they use governor in Matthew. Michael used ruler. He used ruler again. He just called him prince. You know what I'm saying? Being prince of peace, ruler of peace. And what does Jerusalem mean? It's a city of peace. You know what I'm talking about? And where is David's throne at? In Jerusalem. Because remember what the scripture says. It says David ruled for 40 years. Seven years in Hebron, 33 years in Jerusalem. Let's go back to Michael 5. Now he said that the, out of Bethlehem. A raptor, the ruler, come forth. But look at what he said. He said, whose goings forth have been from old and from everlasting. So is this not tying back in what John said, that in the beginning was the word? So let's continue on. Let's see something else. He said, therefore he will give them up until that time which he travail have brought forth. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. Now I don't know if y'all remember that, but we're going to deal with it. Do you hear what he said here? He said, she will travail until the time that she which travail have brought forth. So that should bring back into your mind what's written in Revelation 12. Let's look at Revelation 12. Let's one, let's one say, just for the people's sake who may see this, because y'all know this. We're going to deal with it again. Let's look at verse 1. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And you remember the sun is symbolizing who? Jacob, his wife. And the children of Israel. Genesis 37 lets us know this. And she being with child cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And then when we drop down to verse 5, well, verse 4 anyway, it said, And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and cast them to the earth, and the dragon stood before the woman which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. 
So this is also going back to what we're talking about what Herod did. As you know, he wanted to come slaughter the children to kill the master, which goes back to Moses. This is what did they do during the time of Moses. Let's go over that. Let's see. Let's look at Exodus 2. And let's show you another thing that ties into showing you this is the Messiah. Because they did the same thing during Moses' time. Mm -hmm. Exodus, the second chapter. Exodus 2 and 1. Y'all read it. He said, Then went a man of the house of Levi and took a wife, a daughter of Levi. And when the woman conceived and bare a son, as a matter of fact, we've got to back it up to verse to chapter first chapter. I'm sorry. Let's look at verse uh, verse uh, six first. And it says that Joseph died and all his brethren and all that generation. And the children of Israel were fruitful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceeding mighty. And the land was filled with them. Do you remember what the promise in the covenant was to Abraham? But your children shall be as the sand of the sea, which cannot be numbered for the multitude. So this is what's beginning to occur. Let's see what these people say. Now there arose up a new king over Egypt with new not Joseph. And he said unto his people, Behold, the people of the children of Israel are my, more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal wisely with them, lest they multiply and they come to pass that when they fall out in war, they join also unto our enemies and fight against us, and so get them up out of the land. So now they know they begin to enslave us. But drop down to verse 16. And he said, When you do the offers of a midwife to the Hebrew women, and see them upon the stools, if it be a son, then you shall kill it. But if it be a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God, and did not as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the men children alive. And the king of Egypt called for the midwives, and said unto them, Why have you done this thing, and have saved the men children alive? And the midwives said unto Pharaoh, Because the Hebrew women are not as the Egyptian women, for they are lively, and are delivered heir the midwives coming unto them. Therefore God dealt with the midwives, and the people multiplied and waxed very mighty. So you see, because they feared God, even though these women weren't Hebrews, God blessed them. Why? Because they feared him and did not do what? Not only did not commit murder, but did not kill his people. And it said it came to pass because the midwives feared God that he made them houses. And Pharaoh told all the people, saying, Every son that is born he shall cast into the river, and every daughter shall live. So when we go back to this... Uh, Matthew 2 real quick, just to see that same thing being done. Where it says here in verse 7, And then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently, what time the star appeared. And he said to Bethlehem and said, Go and search diligently for the young child, and when you have found him, bring me word again, that I may come worship him also. And when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. Let's drop down to verse 12. And saying, being warned of God in the dream, they should not return to Herod. They departed into their own country another way. And he said, when they departed, behold, the angel of Yah appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, flee into Egypt, and be thou there until I bring thee word, for Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed into Egypt, and there, and was there unto the death of Herod, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of God by the prophet, saying, Out of Egypt I have called my son. That's Hosea 11 and 1. That's also Exodus 4 and 22, telling you the same thing. But he said that about us when we came up out of Egypt. And then he said it again, knowing what? That both of these things are referring to Yahshua, because he referred to us as his son in Exodus. Then he says, then Herod, when he saw that he was mocked of the wise man, was exceeding wroth, and sent forth and slew all the children that were in Bethlehem and all the coast thereof, from two years old and under, according to the time which he had diligently inquired of the wise man. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying, And Rama was there a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted, because they were not. And I think that's in... Uh, Jeremiah 32, I believe. Let's just make sure. I'm going to say the wrong thing. It might be 31. I think it's 31 and 8. No, 31 and 15. Thus saith Yah, voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. 
Thus saith Yah, refrain thy voice from weeping and thy eyes from tears. For thy work shall be rewarded, saith Yah. They shall come again from the land of the enemy. And there is hope in thy hand, say of Yah, that thy children shall come again to thy own board. So again, you can tell this is t dealing with the master because like we dealt with last week, our hope and faith is what? This man going to redeem us from our enemies, ain't it? That we can serve our, serve our God and without fear and in righteousness and holiness all the days of our life. Well, let's go back to this Michael 5. Let's finish this up. He said, therefore, will he give them up until that time when she travail brought forth? So again, we feel that travail brought forth. I thank God for that because we missed the point where we even started that for. Isaiah 66 and 10. Just to make this clear. Verse, verse uh, 8, verse 7. Before she travail, she brought forth. Before her pain came, she was delivered of a man child. Who have heard such a thing? Who have seen such things? Shall the earth be made and bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as thy aunt prevail, she brought forth her children. Shall I bring them to the birth and not cause to bring forth, say of y'all? Shall I cause to bring forth and shut the womb? Rejoice ye with Jerusalem and be glad with her, all you that love her. Rejoice for joy with her, all you that mourn for her. So we can tell this talking about the Messiah again. Because we know that there from 12, in Revelation 12, because he brought forth a man child who was the rule of the nation with a rod of iron. And this is what he's talking about here in Micah, Jerusalem being with travail, and then her giving birth because the nation of Israel has returned, being led by the Messiah. Let's go back to Micah 5. Because he said that she travail, she brought forth. Then he says, then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel. So that confirms that. And, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of Yah, and the majesty of the name of Yah his God, and they shall abide, for now shall he be great unto the ends of the earth. And we know what his kingdom going to be, from one end of the earth to the other, right? An everlasting dominion which cannot be broken. So now we got Micah saying this man is going forth as from the beginning, what John is testifying to. Because we've got to have scripture to back, so let's look at Proverbs 8 and 22. So let's see, didn't John say in the beginning was the word? And that's what he said. Let's see what he said there. Verse 22 in the 8th chapter of Proverbs says, Y'all possessed me in the beginning of his way, before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting. Didn't they say this man was going forth was from everlasting in Michael? Let's just make so now. From the beginning or ever the earth was. So when we go look at Revelation 13, I want to say verse 2. If you look at Revelation 13 and 8, what does it say? It was actually verse 9. Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. No, it's yes, verse 8. And they that dwell upon the earth shall worship him, whose names were not written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundation of the world. So doesn't this let this be known this man was around before the world was made? You know what I'm talking about? There's other spots that say that, but nevertheless. It says before beginning or ever the earth was. He said when there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water, before the mountains were set up, before the hills was, was I brought forth, while as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world, when he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth, when he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the water should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him. And I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. So we say his delight was with the sons of men. And this is going to tie in to something else in a minute. Let's look at our Psalm 68 and 18. He say his delight was with the sons of men. You got to see what his delight is. Let's see what that delight is. Then we'll go to Proverbs 30. We'll tie something else in and something in John. We'll tie some we'll go a few things in here, Lord. Please. He said, Thou have ascended on high. Well, let's look at verse 17. He said, The chariots of God are 20,000, even thousands of angels. The Lord is among them as in Sinai in the holy place. So, didn't this man say he coming back with uh, a whole squadron of angels? You know what I'm talking about? And you're going to see something about the angels in a little bit. Lord, he said, Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive. We know that he took sin and death captive. 
We know that he sits at the right hand of the Father. How do we know that? Just look at Revelation 3 and 20. And we'll look at uh, Revelation 12 for another, uh, another witness on the same now. Revelation 3 and 20, or 21. To him that overcome will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame, and am sat down with my Father in his throne. So then when we look at Revelation 12, what does he say here? And verse 5, And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and unto his throne. So let's see something. We're going to look at a story. We're going to come back to this Isaiah 60, I mean Psalm 60, 68 and 18, but we're going to look at a story. Let's go to 2 Kings, 2nd chapter, verse 1. Because didn't it say he was called up to the throne? We're going to show the son. He showed us this earlier this week. He brought it out of on, on, on the show with Carl. We're going to show y'all something here. 2 Kings, 2nd chapter, first verse. And it came to pass, when Yahweh would take up Elijah into heaven by a whirlwind, that Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. Now you know that, I mean you may not be familiar with it, I can't recall the exact location. Uh, like you said, you could do it on your own independent study and take it out for yourself if I don't find it before. But uh, Elisha was Elijah's disciple. We could be in agreement on that. Because he cast his mantle on Elisha, and you know what Elisha told him? He said, man... Let me go back to the house and do this here with my father and first. And he was like, you know, why you troubling me or whatever the case may be. But he know what it was because he said Elisha was set up to be a prophet in Elijah's tent. So listen to what it say now. Say it came to pass that Elijah was going to be taken into heaven by a whirlwind. And Elijah went with Elisha from Gilgal. And Elijah said unto Elisha, Terry, here I pray thee, for Yah has sent me to Bethel. What is Bethel? That's the house of God, right? We know that from Genesis, right? We know that that's where the first uh, tabernacle was set up, right? The first house before it was moved to Jerusalem. So now when he's saying this here, he's talking about he's sending me to who? He's sending me to Yahshua is what he's saying. But let's, let's keep on rolling up. And Elisha said unto him, As y'all live and as thy soul live, I will not leave. So they went down to Bethel. And the sons of the prophets that were at Bethel came forth to Elisha and said unto him, Know, not, know that thou that y'all will take away thy master from thy head today? So if he called him a master, what did he just call him? He called him rabbi. He called him teacher. Remember, that's what master means. That's what, what did he say? Call no man master upon the earth because you have one master, even the Messiah, and all of you are brethren. Remember, he, he's supposed to be a man taking his position. So that means who was teaching him? Elijah was teaching him. Listen to what he said. And he said, uh, oh yeah, verse 3. He said, yea. And he said, yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Elisha, tarry here. I pray thee, for Yah hath sent me to Jericho. And he said, As Yah live, and as thy soul live, I will not leave. So they came to Jericho. And the sons of the prophets that were at Jericho came to Elisha and said unto him, Know thou that, that, that Yah will take away thy master from thy head today? And he answered us, Yea, I know it. Hold your peace. And Elijah said unto him, Terry, I pray thee here, for Yah hath sent me to Jordan. And he said, As Yah live, and as thy soul live, I will not leave thee. And they too went on. And fifty men of the sons of prophets went and stood to view afar off, and they stood too by Jordan. And Elijah took his mantle and wrapped it together and smote the waters, and they were divided hither and thither. So they too went over dry ground. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. And Elisha said, I pray thee, let a double portion of thy spirit be upon me. So you hear Elisha asking for a double portion of the spirit, right? Now hold this here and go back to that Psalm 68 and 18. All this is going to make some sense. Make some sense. Just some more. So what, look what he said. He said, He ascended on high, let captivity captive, right? Thou hast received gifts from men, yea, the rebellious also, that God might dwell among them. So he said, He's giving gifts unto men. What is that gift? That's the Holy Ghost. We're going to see about that gift, though. Then he said, uh, That God might dwell among them. Now let's look at that in Leviticus 26. Verse 11. Because remember what he said, Bethel, you keep that in mind. Leviticus 26 and 11. He said, And I will set up my tabernacle amongst them, amongst you, and my soul shall not abhor you, and I will mourn among you, and will be your God, and ye shall be my people. So he said, He's going to set up his house in you. And we know what? Bethel's the house of God. I'm going to set up Yahshua in you. Let's get another witness to that. What do we want to go after that? Ezekiel 37, about 27. Ezekiel 37 and 27. He 
say, My tabernacle also shall be with them. Yea, I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And the heathen shall know that I, Yah, do sanctify Israel, when my sanctuary shall be in the midst of them forevermore. So when this man is dwelling in you, because he dealt with it in the previous chapter, in 36, about him putting, in about verse 26, about him putting his walls inside of us, and then giving us a new spirit and a new heart, and taking out that stony heart and giving us a heart of flesh, that we will walk in his judgments and do them, which means what? Let's look at 2 Corinthians 6 and about 16. Lord willing, we're going to get back to the second team because we got to. When I said second Corinthians 6 and 16. So when we read that, let's listen to what the man said. And he said, What agreement have the temple of God with idols? For you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. So you know what I'm talking about? So he's sitting here saying that we are going to be the temple of the living God, or what? Stones built up on something, which we're going to see. But before we can be them stones built up on something, we have to receive something. Let's go back to that second key. Everybody all right? Lord, let us know start making this into that devil. In my will, we stop that. Verse nine. Thank you. I appreciate you. Know. And he said, "Thou hast asked a hard thing. Nevertheless, if thou see me when I am taken from thee, it shall be so unto thee. But if not, it shall not be so." Now this is going back to this thing. Think of what it is said in Psalm sixty-eight and eighteen that he gave gifts unto men that y'all might dwell with them, right? You know what I'm saying? So that's telling you that the Holy Ghost might dwell with you. He just asked Elijah for what? A double portion of the spirit. He told him, if you see me when I'm taken away from you, you can get it. Hold on now. And he said, and it came to pass as they still went on and talked that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and part of them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. So he said, he saw Elijah go up into heaven and he got a double portion of the spirit. Drop down about... Uh, just so you can hear this. Verse 15. And when the sons of the prophets which were the view at Jericho saw him, they said the spirit of Elijah doth rest on Elisha. And they came to meet him and bowed themselves to the ground for him. So we read all that there just to hear this here. Let's go to Acts 1 and 1. Uh, and, and, and just tell me, does this sound like that was talking about Yahshua and just not talking about Elijah going up in the heaven? We're going to see. Let's just see. Oh, by the fact, before we go to Acts 1 and 1, pardon me, Luke 24. Luke 24, first. Luke 24, first. We'll start at verse 46. Or verse 48. You say, and ye are witnesses of these things. You heard what he said, they witnesses of these things. When the lie of the witness was a witness of what happened. So get, let's go to Isaiah 43, first. 43 and 10. Isaiah 43 and 10. Matter of fact, verse 9 is even better. Hallelujah to God. Verse 9 is even better. Listen to what this man said. Let all the nations be gathered together. Remember this now. And let the people be assembled. Who among them can declare this and show us form of things? Let them bring forth their witnesses that they may be justified. Or let them hear and say it is true. Ye are my witnesses, saith Yah, and my servant whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me. And understand that I am he. And before me there was no God for me, neither shall there be after me. I, even I, am Yah, and beside me there is no Savior. I have declared and saved. I have showed when there was no strange God among you. Therefore ye are my witnesses, saith Yah, that I am God. So you heard what the master told his disciples. We go back to Luke 24. He said, you my witnesses. Because of them witnessing his death and resurrection, do they not know now know that Yah is God? And that he also is God, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. So listen to verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endowed with power from on high. Have we not in a couple spots read with the promise of his Father more? But let's look at the promise of his Father just one quick second. Isaiah 59 and 20. We're going to get to that act one. So just be patient with it. Isaiah 59 and 20. Let's hear about that promise. So we touched it on a little bit, but let's make it clear. Let's make it clear so there's no doubt. And he's saying, The Redeemer shall come to Zion unto them that turn from transgressing in Jacob, saith God. So he's saying, The Redeemer going to come to Zion, right? Isaiah 52 and 3 tells us what? You sold yourselves for nothing, you shall be redeemed without money. 
we read last week, when you read 1 Peter, what did he say? You haven't been redeemed with corruptible things like silver and gold from the vain behavior of your fathers, but you've been redeemed with the blood of the Lamb, which was without spot, which was precious. Or as he said in Acts 20 and 28, you've been cursed God. Matter of fact, that's even better. We're going to read Acts 20 and 28, though, just to pour in the fact that this man is God. You know, a lot of people don't think so. It is what it is. I really don't care. I know what the book says, and I'm going to take the book. What y'all going to take? Okay, we ain't got 500, but you can take the book. And my name ain't Alex. I ain't from Canada, buddy. Straight up. The Acts 2028. He said, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock which, over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God which he has purchased with his own blood. You know what I'm talking about? That's what Paul said. You've been redeemed. You've been bought with a price. Ain't that what he said? That price is this man's blood. But going back to Isaiah. He say, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith Yah, my spirit that is upon thee, my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, seed saith Yah, from his corpse and fast. So when we read Proverbs 1 and 23, what does he say? Turn ye at my reproof, and I will pour out my spirit upon you, and I will make my words known unto you. You know what I'm talking about? Ain't that what he said? So this is dealing with heaven and things. And we're going to get back to that ascending too. I thank God he brought that back to mind. But now we see what the promise is, right? That's the Holy Ghost. You know what I'm talking about? We made that clip. But we're going to read one more spot. We're going to read Ezekiel 36 and 26. Because we're going to show you something else out of the book of Acts when we get there. We're going to show you something else. Ezekiel 36 and 26. Might be 25. Let's see. It's 25. He said, Then will I sprinkle clean water upon you, and ye shall be clean from all your filthiness, and from all your idols will I cleanse you. So, okay. We know that how does a young man cleanse his way by the taking heed according to thy word. Isaiah 1 and 16 tells you to wash you, make you clean. Cease to do evil from before my eyes. Learn to do well, do justice and judgment. The master told you in John 15 and 4, you're clean from the word that I spoke unto you. But also, how else do we get clean? We get cleansed from sin and death by getting what? By getting baptized. Then coming out, we showing forth his resurrection, the walk in newness of life, that we're what? We're born a son of God. You know what I'm saying? And now when we do this here, what happens? Now that God may dwell amongst you. Now, now you might be his temple, his holy tabernacle. So let's continue on. He's saying, a new heart also will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you, and I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I will give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you shall keep my judgments and do them. So this is again showing forth that God is dwelling in you. So now we have established this the Holy Ghost. So now let's look at Acts 1. Because the master told them to dwell in Jerusalem until power came from on high. Did it not? Okay, so let's see what Acts 1 and 1 say. Let's see what 1 and 1 say. It says, In the former treaties have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Yahshua began to do and teach until the day in which he was taken up. After that he through the Holy Ghost had given commandments unto the apostles whom he had chosen, to whom he showed himself alive after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days, and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God, and being assembled together with them, commanded that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, you have heard of me. Because you know, he sat and told him, right? He told them all these things that they'll get this. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. Not many days hence. And you know what he say? I'm going to cleanse you with clean water. We know the Word is Spirit, right? I'm going to baptize you with me. Because I'm the Word. I'm baptizing with the Holy Ghost. This is the Word to say. And when they, when they therefore will come together, they ask of him, saying, Lord, without this time, restore again the kingdom of Israel. And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father have put in his own power. But ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, unto the uttermost part of the earth. And when he had spoke these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly towards heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, why are you stand gazing up into heaven? The same Yahshua which is taken up from you into heaven, so shall come in like manner as you've seen him go into heaven. Is that not the same thing we just read dealing with Elijah and Elisha? Did not he stand there with not these men that he had chosen? Did they not watch him depart into heaven just like Elisha watched his master depart into heaven? In the same like fashion and manner? 
That's a beautiful thing right there to see. Not only was that talking about a lot, but I was talking about him and went down in the same exact fashion. You know what I'm talking about? Just didn't have nobody telling him he's going to take your mouth out of there. He said, why are you stand up at this man the same way he left it, the same way he's coming back? He stood there and watched this man come, go, and then he got a double portion of his spirit right after he left, right? Mm -hmm. So let's look at Acts 2 and 1. Let's see what he got, what these girls got. He said, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they will come accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothed in tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they got the Spirit just the same way Elisha got the Spirit, right? But then we read Isaiah, he said, All nations will be there to be witnesses. Let's look what it says. And they were dwelling at Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. And now when this door is abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galeans? And now here we, every man in our tongue, wherein we were born, Corinthians and Medes and Elamites and the dwellers in Mesopotamia and Judea and Cappadocia and Pontus and Asia and Fiber and Pamphylia and Egypt and the parts of Libya, about Cyrene, strangers of Rome, Jews and proselytes, Cretes and Arabians, who do hear them that speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So are they not bearing witness to him just like he said they would, declaring that he is the Savior and there is no strange God amongst them? But he said, you seen me ascend into heaven. Because it said he ascended on high. Let's look at John 3. Of course, you know, you heard this a couple weeks ago about Jacob's ladder and what that was talking about. Is it John 3? What is it? Oh, there it is, John 3. Look right at it. Verse 13, he said, No man have ascended up to heaven, but he that came down from heaven even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So this is going back to the beginning. Because he said, ain't no man ascended up to heaven. Didn't he say he's ascended on high? We dealt with when this man ascended on high. But he let you know I ascended on high. But yet I came down and I'm going back. So let's go to uh, Genesis 1. Because it said in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, did it not? He said it was in the beginning. I think we pretty firmly established this. So when we look in Genesis 1, In verse 2, we'll just start in verse 1. He said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Didn't he say before the heavens and the earth was made in Proverbs 8? He said, I was there. He said, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. We know y'all saw the Spirit of God. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And what does 2 Corinthians 6 say? What agreement does light have with darkness? Let's look at 1 John 1 and 9. Though. Let's look at that. Actually, 1 and 3. Actually, 1 and 1. And we're going to hit Psalm 33 in a second, too. Because now we can firmly establish, we're going to establish that Yahshua was that light that was made, and then obviously it comes through to what John is going to say that he made everything. He said, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life. So we know that the math, the math already told us in John 6, 63, the words that he speaks, they are spirit and they are life. You know what I'm talking about? So when you feel with the Holy Ghost, you got the word of life in you because the words of the living Father are dwelling in you. His word is dwelling in you. Yahshua is dwelling in you, which is life. He said, for the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was the, with the Father, and was manifested unto us. So he said, we're manifesting that eternal life, which was with the Father, and we know the Son was with the Father. He don't let that be known. I'm the only one ascended and descended from heaven. He said, that which we have seen and, uh, and, and declared, declare we unto you, that you may also have fellowship with us, and truly our fellowship is with the Father, and with his Son, Yahshua the Messiah. And these things we write unto you, that your joy may be full. Then, this, then is the message which we have heard of him, and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So you see how he separated the light from the darkness? Because there is no darkness in God. Period. Mm -hmm. Acts 26 and 18 tell you that. He said, I come to open their eyes. I send you to open their eyes, to turn us from darkness to light, 
from the power of Satan to the power of God, that they might receive the remission of sins and be sanctified in the faith that is in me. So listen to what the man says. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, if we walk in your soul, as he is in the light, as he is in the Father, because the Father's light too, they have the Elohim head, the God body, the God head, so, uh, I should say, we have fellowship one with another in the blood of Yahshua, the Messiah, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So remember what he said, how does the young man cleanse his way? By taking heed according to thy word, by taking heed to Yahshua, you can cleanse your way. Look at Psalm 33 and 5. Now we're going to go back to John 1. Psalm 33 and 5. Let me get in the right spot. Actually, we're going to start at verse 4. It says, For the word of Yah is right, and all his works are done in truth. Say, The word of Yah is right. You know what I'm saying? We know Yah sure, right? Was he not sinless? Did he not tell us we had the works of the Father, the Spirit, and truth for John the fourth chapter? Did he not do the same? Did he not say, I sanctify myself by the truth, that they might sanctify themselves by the truth? He says, uh, he loved righteousness and judgment. The earth is full of the goodness of Yah. By the word of Yah were the heavens made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. So it says, by the word of Yah, the heaven was made. Who is the word of Yah? That's his son. He said, by the breath was the host of heaven made. Then he said, that breath was the spirit of Yah. Is he not the spirit of God? We just heard that, the word of life. Come on now. I mean, that's pretty plain. Let's go back to John 1. Though. I mean, it's plain to those who believe on the Messiah, as the scripture has said. I pray to God y'all can see this man. Is he, does he say it makes sense? Is that clear? Is it, can you see him? Or am I just tripping? I don't know if I'm tripping. Now let me know. I go, to, I go down there to talk about a seal. Well, they got created out there. You can make that. It's all right. They won't stay, I won't stand there too long. They won't put me on no uh, authority. I'm going to jump out the window. Well, we have verse 3. Remember now, he said the same was in the beginning with God. I think we've established that. I think we've established that the beginning was the Word, and the Word is God. I think that's been established. He said all things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. Didn't it just say he the Word of life? And in him is life? Because if he dwells in you, what do you have? You have eternal life. Let's look at that. Romans 8. I want to say verse 8. If I just would not like skip over the chapter, we might do that. Verse 9. No, actually, let's look at verse 6. Verse 5. Why not? He said, For they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that was going back to the discussion we had a couple days ago. And I'll be telling you that, and, and you heard, I think, earlier this week or last week, that you know the, the word of God is, uh, is foolishness to people of the world. It's pure as like everything we just said, and they don't look at you like I'm stone cold crazy. You know what I'm saying? Because this don't make no sense. Because it's carnal mind. Carnal mind and the spiritual mind can't meet together. As the man just said, ain't that what Paul testifying to? We already know that now. Hold that. Get out of there. Get out of there 59 and 1. We're going to come back. We're going to testify to it. Because people put it in their little Bible tract, right? but they don't really break it down to you how, how sin separates. But what is sin? That, that's works of the flesh, right? So this is going to separate. This is going to go back to what I seen you told somebody the other day when they was like, God, hear everybody prayers. You just ain't mentioned this verse right here. Isaiah 59 and 1. He said, Behold, y'all's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is his ear heavy that it cannot heal. Say, this man all may short. He can save and he can heal. He said, But your iniquities have separated you, have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not heal. You know what I'm talking about? So we already know anything that's, uh, uh, that's sin is going to be what? Right? The works of the flesh, right? And you know the works of the flesh, as the man just said, this is enmity with God. They can't meet the Greek men. Why? Because the flesh want to do what the flesh want to do. What does Proverbs 14 and 12 say? It's a way that seems right unto a man. But the way they're all about it are, 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 is death. You know what I'm talking about? But we already know. The man say his word is right. His works are true. His way is perfect. So if you're walking in his way, ain't you going to have life? Ain't you going to have peace? Look at John 16 and 33 and John 14 27. Because when the word wasn't in you, look what the, the master told us now. 
We got to look at these things. The why what is needful for us to obey is needful to be the walking, living tabernacle of the living God. Look what he saying in verse 27 of the 14th chapter of John. But we're going to back up to verse 23. Make it even better. Make it even clearer. Yahshua answered and said unto him, If a man love me, he will keep my words, and my father will love him, and he will come unto him and make our abode with him. If you make your abode with somebody, what is that talking about? That means dwelling with you, right? Didn't he say that Yahweh God might dwell amongst them? Didn't he say, I set my sanctuary amongst them? I set my word in them? We're going to deal with that too. That all of the covenant. I thank God for the Holy Ghost because he brings a lot of things to mind right now at the present time. He said, He that love me not, keep not my sayings, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father which sent me. So if somebody calls, they're not going to hear him, right? Then Paul say, The things of the word of the Spirit are they foolishness to a natural man, he cannot receive them. Earlier in this chapter, the Master said, Even the Spirit of truth which the world cannot receive. He said, Because they neither hear him nor even know him. The, uh, David told you in Psalm 92, I think by verse 8 or verse 6, the man said, the brutish man does not understand this. The fool don't understand it either. You're the fool, you're spiritually retarded. Which means you're carnal. You're fleshly. You're thinking only on what you can see right now. You know what I'm talking about? I can't see. That's the same way we had this discussion with, with Brother Ron and Brother Kevin last, last night. About when, when parents tell children to do something. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I tell you to come in the house at 12. Why I got to come in the house at 12? Because I said so. Don't worry about why. It's a reason why I'm telling you not to do it. But you so worried about why you're not seeing the end result. Or if you just do what I say, I'm a space for son. It's killing the jack boys out the time. And I ain't nothing going on good. It's the reason why I'm telling you to do this. Here. The man told you in the book of Isaiah, I am Yahweh thy God, which teach thee the prophet, which lead thee in the way that he should go. The things that I declare are right. I'm telling you this for your own benefit. You know what I'm saying? And that's how we don't look at it. The man is telling you these things for your own benefit and profit, but you want to know why I can't do it. Why? 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 Why, why would you question your parents if you know your parents got more experience over you than telling you these things so you don't hurt yourself? But you know what children, rebellious children want to do? Do what they want to do. Then that's what he said in Isaiah 68 and 18. I give a gift even to the rebellious. Ain't that what he said? Because he's giving a gift to the rebellious for sinners. I'm giving you a chance at repentance that you can come back and receive the Holy Ghost. We're going to read about it in Acts 3 before we get finished. But let's keep on going. He said, These things I have spoken unto you, being yet present with you. But the Comforter, which is the Holy Ghost, whom the Father will send in my name, he shall teach you all things and bring all things to your remembrance whatsoever I said unto you. So what is he telling you? That's that word of life that John mentioned, right? I mean, the word is going to be in you. It's going to talk to you. It's going to speak to you. It's going to tell you what to do and where to go and how to do it. He said, peace I leave you with. He said, my peace I leave with you. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world give. Give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled. Neither let it be afraid. Ye have heard that I said unto you, I go away and come again unto you. If you love me, you will rejoice. Because I say, I go unto, unto the Father. For my Father is greater than I. And now I told you before it came to pass that when it has come to pass, you might believe. Did he not tell us all these things? Didn't we read some of these things in the Old Testament just now? You know, he told us all these things that we might believe. That's an example like with Elisha and Elijah. He told us all these things that we might believe that he'd come up and snatch him up. How do we know that? We'll go back to that cloud in a minute. And he says, well, hereafter I will not talk much with you, for the prince of the world come and have nothing in me. But the world may know that I love the Father, as the Father gives me commandment, even so I do. Arise, let us go hence. So when we look at John 16 and 27, or 33, I should say. I'm sorry, John 16 and 33. He said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me you might have peace. In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I overcome the world. You hear this here? So through this man, this man telling you through him, and he is the word. Through the word, you're going to have peace. What is that peace? That's that peace that you've been delivered from death. you delivered from sin. And he say, I send it on high to captivity captive. How can you not have peace? Look at Psalm 32 and 1. How can you not have peace that when the living God is dwelling in you, this has came to pass? This is what done came to pass. This is what the man came to do. Blessed is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man whom y'all accuse not in equity, and whose spirit there is no God. So this is what happens when God dwells in you, right? Is your sins remitted? Let's see what the scriptures say on that. Look at Jeremiah 31 and 35. Let's just see what the scriptures say on that. Let's just see what the scriptures say on that. We just let the voice. 
verse 34 it is. Verse 33, actually. He said, But this shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith God. I will put my law in their inward parts, I will write it in their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people, and they shall teach no more every man his neighbor, and every man his brother, saying, No, Yah, for they shall all know me from the least unto them. So the least of them unto the greatest of them. Ain't that what the Holy Ghost said it would do, that it would bring all things in your remembrance? He tell you that again, that the Holy Ghost will teach you and lead you into all truth. He'll lead you in the Word. Listen to what he said. That's the same thing that John was saying in 1 John 1 28, that once you receive that anointing, you have no need that any man teach you. Huh? You should know that. For persons, has this man not taught you things out of the book that no man has sat down and told you, even if you have been told them before? He either brought it back to your remembrance that you have been told it, or he showed you something new, right or wrong. Okay. Brought something back to your remembrance. Amen. Hallelujah for y'all too. He worked now. Ain't not now what you just experienced, is that not confirming what his book says? Okay. I just want to make sure I ain't crazy. Listen to what he said. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I'll remember that sin no more. When is this new covenant established? Look at Matthew 26 and 29. Look at it. Let's see what it says, man. Because it's all about the mouth. Is it not? Ain't the whole book about it? Did he say he come to the volume of the book? Verse 28, actually. He said, For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. So when we go look at John 18, we're going to get back to Romans 8. Was it John 19? Yahshua, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, saith, I thirst. Now there was a set of vessel of vinegar, and they filled the sponge with vinegar and put on it hyssop and put it in his mouth. Look at Psalm 69 and 21. Say they put the bringing the vinegar to him. Or the sour wine. Bringing that to him. Bringing something he don't want to sip on. I don't want none of that. That's nasty. Look at verse 21. He said, they gave me also gall for my meat, and in my thirst they gave me vinegar to drink. Huh? And look at verse 22, because look at what was going on. That's what we were just listening to, speaking about that. He said, let their table become a snare before them, and that which has been for their welfare, let it become a trap. Huh? Because the door was about to go round, pastor was about to go round. He said, let that be a trap to them, because it's supposed to be for their welfare, because what happened in Exodus 12 was pointing to me. And they became in what was for their welfare. Now it's a trap. How we know that? Look at Isaiah 8. Look at Isaiah 8. Let's see the fullness of the book now. Isaiah 8 and 14. And he, and he shall be for a sanctuary, for a house, but for a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense to both houses of Israel, for a gin and for a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. And many among them shall stumble and fall and be broken and be snared and be taken. Now he say many of them are going to be snared and be broken and be taken. Look at Psalm 118. Lord, well, we're going to finish Romans 8. We're going to get back to it. But let's look at Psalm 118 real fast. Let's this is what he said. This is Yah's doing. He said, Oh, the stone which the builders refused is become the headstone of the corner. This is Yah's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes. Huh? So they said the headstone of the, of the house, the builders done rejected it. Let's look at Luke. I think it's 17. Is it Luke 17? Not in Luke 17. It might be Matthew 17. I can't remember where it's at. But I know, he, oh, maybe it's Matthew 22. Oh, there it is. Matthew 21. Thank God. Verse 42. 
Yahshua said unto them, Did ye never read in the scriptures the stone which the builders rejected, the same has become the head of the corner? This is God's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I say unto you, the kingdom of God shall be taken from you, and given to a nation, bringing forth the fruits thereof. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken, and whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind into power. Ain't just testifying to what I said so far. It's the same thing happened. It was supposed to be for a prophet, board of Lord, say, let it be a standard trap tool. Let it, let it take them. Let it make them fall. Same thing happening to this very day. What was that? John 19? Let's finish that up. Verse 30. He said, and when Yahshua therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. He bowed his head and gave up the ghost. The Jews, therefore, because it was a preparation that the body should not retain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was a high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Yahshua and saw that he was dead already, they break not his leg. So let's look at Exodus 12 and 46, because we know he's a Passover lamb. So let's look at that. Let's see what the book say about it. And it says, In one house shall it be eaten, that thou shalt not carry forth out the flesh abroad out of thy house. Neither shall you break the bone thereof. So then when we look at Psalms 34 and 20, it goes to make even more sense. Psalm 34 and 20 says, we'll look at verse 19, or even verse 17. The righteous cry, and Yah here delivered them out of all their troubles. Because remember what he said he, in Psalm 16, he said, Yah in his right hand has his hope, right? He know he ain't going to suffer his holy one to see corruption. He heard the cry of Yahshua, and he, and he saved him. Yah is near unto them that are of a broken heart and saved, but such as be of a contrite spirit. Didn't he say in Hebrews 5, he was heard because he feared? Even though he was a son, he learned obedience by the things that he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the captain and author of eternal salvation for all those that obey him. Hallelujah for Yahshua. And he said, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but Yah deliver him out of them all. He keep all his bones, not one of them is broken. Huh? And let's go back to John 19. Again, testifying to the master. So when we read that, we look at verse 34. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side, and forthwith came there out blood and water. So now we go look at Zechariah 12 and 10. I remember some of you see a long time ago. You was looking just as happy as you was just then. I remember that, that was sitting in the Monte Carlo. Zechariah 12 and 10. What do you, listen to what he said. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and of supplications. They shall look upon me whom they have pierced. They shall mourn for him as one mourned for his only son, and shall be bitterness, and shall be in bitterness for him, as one that is in bitterness for his firstborn. And you know the people were doing that, were the ones who believed. But look at Micah 6 and 8, though. Look at what Micah got to say, because Micah says something about it, too. It's actually 6 and 7. But well, we're going to look at 6 and 6. Listen to what he said. Where well, shall I come before Yah, and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? He said, Will God be pleased with the thousands of rams or with ten thousand rivers of oil? Or shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of the the fruit of my body, for the sin of my soul? Huh? So let's look at Hebrew ten, because he said, I didn't want all that. Look at Hebrew ten. We could have read it out the scripture, but you know, we spent a lot of time in there. We'll read it out of this one here. Verse 4, y'all. But actually, it's verse 1. He said, For the law, having a shadow of good things to come, and not the very image of things, can never with those sacrifices which they offered year by year continually make the comers thereunto perfect. Can't get made perfect with them sacrifices we were doing. But as we've seen with the Passover lamb, he couldn't break his leg. And he didn't break the master's leg. All those things that were spoken of were a shadow for the good things to come by the personage of our Savior and Lord, Yahshua the Messiah. For when they would not have ceased to be offered because the, that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sins. 
But in those sacrifices there is remembrance again made of sins every year. For it is not possible that the blood of bulls and of goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he come into the world, he say, Sacrifice and offering thou would not, but a body hast thou prepared me. And burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin thou hast no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written in me to do thy will, O God. And he said, and this is quoting Psalm 40. You know what he said after that? He just didn't put it in there. He said, To do the will of thy will, O God. You know what he said after that? Thy law is within my heart. And he said, That's what a new covenant is. The word in your heart that Yahweh your God might dwell amongst you. Then he said above when he said sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sins I would not. Neither had pleasure therein which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He take away the first that he may establish the second by which we are all sanctified through the offering of the body of Yahshua the Messiah once and for all. You know what I'm talking about? So he said, tell didn't Michael just talk about what I'm going to give? Thousands of the rivers of oil. He said he ain't pleased with none of them things. He said, I get the fruit of my body, even my firstborn for my transgression. Let's go back to John 19. And we'll get back to Romans 8 in a minute. Oh, whoa, hold on. Revelation 1 and 7. Because it said they pierced him, right? And it said blood and water came out of him, right? But let's look at something first. Let's look at 1 John 5. And then we'll get to that Revelation 1. They'll tie back into the clouds. We have to tie the clouds back in. Look at verse 4 though. 1 John 5 and 4, everybody. 1 John 5 and 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcome the world, and this is the victory that overcome the world, even our faith. Who is he that overcome the world, but he that believes that Yahshua is the Son of God? So we know, if you don't overcame the world, you've been born of God. We dealt with that a little bit last week. He said, this is he that came by water and blood. You know what I'm saying? So he's saying coming by water and blood, you know, by spirit, and by blood of men, because he was made what? According to what? The seed of David, according to the flesh. Even Yahshua the Messiah, not by water only, but by water and by blood. And it is the Spirit that bear witness, because the Spirit is true. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. This is where these people get that Trinity stuff from. But it didn't say it means with three different gods. It said that the Father and the Word, we've established that Yahshua is the Word, so He is God, because it's in here telling you the Father and the Son, they God together. And the Holy Ghost, all these things are one accord. How do we know this? Because John 17 and 23 tells us this. Look what John 17 and 23 tells us. It tells us this. Matter of fact, yeah, John 17 and 23. He said, I and them and thou and me, that they may be made, that they may be made perfect in one. Because that's what we just dealt with, right? Being sanctified forever by this man. Because he said, he that sanctified and he that sanctified all are one. And he said, and that the world may know that thou hast sent me and hast loved them as thou hast loved me. So if all of us are perfect and one, don't that mean all of us meet in agreement? So that means the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, all of them are one, they meet in agreement. Listen to what he said though. And there are three that bear witness in the earth, the Spirit, and the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. He said, if we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his son. So when that water and blood came out of him, we know that dealing with the sacrificial law at the same time. We know that the first covenant in Exodus 24 was established with water and blood. He mentioned this in Hebrews 9 again, because that's where he was getting it from. So we got to have the water and blood to do what? Establish the covenant. Something got to be spilled. Without remission, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. That's what Hebrews say. That's what the law say. And he says, uh, he that believe on the Son of God have witness in himself. He that believe not God have made him a liar, because he believe not the record that God gave of the Son. And this is the record that God has given unto us, eternal life, and his life is in his Son. He that have the Son have life. He that have not the Son of God have not life, which is going to go back to this Romans 8, what we're talking about, which is the word of life. So these three things, that water and blood came out of them was significant, because the Spirit is bearing witness. The word is bearing witness that this is true. The water and the blood is bearing witness that this is true. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost in heaven is already bearing witness that this is true. That Yahshua is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that this is eternal life, and that the Father is the true God, did it not? And he said what? We already dealt with this here. And we his witnesses. You know what I'm saying? And when the Spirit of God dwells in you, did he say you'll do what? You'll be my witnesses. You'll bear witness to me? Because what did he say in Revelation? The testimony of Yahshua is the spirit of prophecy. What is prophesying? That's bearing witness to the works of God, is it not? Amen. 
So let's go on back and look at this Revelation 1 and 7. Revelation 1 and 7, y'all. Listen to what he said. He said, Behold, he come with clouds. Didn't the angel say he, he left with clouds? He coming back the same way? Ain't that how Elijah left? Okay. And every eye shall see him, and they also which pierced him, and all kindreds of the earth shall well because of him, even so. Amen. So let's look at Daniel 7 and 9. And then we'll get to this Colossians 1. In fact, let's look at Colossians 1. Keep this in mind about the cloud. And let's look at Colossians 1. Because then we'll go to Daniel 7 and 9. Keep that in Colossians 1 by verse 13. Verse 12. Matter of fact, verse 10. Let's see what's that. Colossians 1 and 10, everybody. He said that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, increasing in the knowledge of God. So Paul desires that we what? Walk worthy. We walk worthy in what we walk in. Holiness. And then he says that, that we do everything pleasing and being free, fruitful in every good work, which means we manifest in the fruits of the Spirit because the seed of the Word of God dwells, dwells in us. And that we increase in the knowledge of God because when you increase in the knowledge of God, does that not get you stronger and stronger in the Word? Does that allow you, does that allow you to be steadfast and know what you're standing on and why you're standing on it, that you will not be moved? But as Paul mentioned, you fight the good fight of faith because you know what you're fighting for and why you're fighting he says, strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. So he says, being strengthened with might. Guess what? What do you say? Trust ye in y'all forever. The faith of y'all, the trust in y'all, the hope in y'all, that's everlasting strength. Then he says, with joyfulness, we know the joy of y'all is your strength. Your joy in his word and in the mercies and love and kindness that he showed unto his creation and Israel specifically and the Gentiles who accepted. You know what I'm talking about? That you should get joy from that. You should be happy from that. And then since you trust in him and your mind is stayed on his word, that's your strength. You can't be moved. You stand on the rock. Lord permit, we'll deal with the rock a little bit. We might have to save it for next week. Who knows? He knows. Then he said you got that patience and long suffering. What is that? Patience and long suffering pretty much the same thing. And what is that? That's fruits of the spirit, right? You know what I'm talking about? That's the manifesting of the attributes of God mentioned in Exodus 34. When Job told you, remember, look at Job who was patient in affliction. So what I'm not to say, in the world you're going to have tribulation. But I don't give you peace like the world gives. You know what I'm talking about? As a matter of fact, hold that. Get me to 2 Corinthians 7 and 9. Listen to this here. Remember this here. He said we get peace from him because of this. 2 Corinthians 7 and 10 actually. Listen to what he said. For God is sorrow work repentance to salvation, not to be repented of. For the sorrow of the world work death. So we go back to Colossians 1. So you know, if you got God in sorrow, whether it's to cease from sin or just the things that these things things bring forth salvation, because you know these are things that are not pleasing to God. You don't want to do these things. That's why he said, Bless are those that are mourn, because they'll be comforted. What is that comfort? Salvation. But when the world makes you sorry, that ain't bringing no life to you. Ain't no word of life in the sorrow of the world. We see many people been sorrow, sorrowful in the world, have we not? Some of ourselves included, right or wrong. And what is that what sorrow of the world? You ain't getting no hope or no life from that. But if you got God in sorrow, you know it's open life in that, because it's going to lead you to repentance. That man say ain't nothing that you don't even you don't even supposed to turn from God in sorrow. That brings forth salvation. How many people out here got a God in sorrow? It ain't many. They got world in sorrow. I just was watching a documentary today. Girl said her brother got killed. She was mad with God. What you mad with God for? That's world in sorrow. You know what I'm talking about? You had God in sorrow. You'd have looked at it and been like, woo! I need to get myself right with the Lord, just like Job say. Hey, God, give it. God, take it away. That's his. You can't tell him when he's going to take what he is. That's the problem that people have. And you heard people don't go ask God for nothing. They go tell him. What child you don't go tell their parent what they want? A child don't want to get slapped in the mouth. You know what I'm talking about? Especially if they're born a black, black, black parent. Daddy, I don't want this here. You know what I want? Shut your mouth. That's what I want. You know what I'm saying? That's a lot. That when, when, you, when you look at the father like that, that you get angry with him because of what he what he chooses to do, or with his rules and regulations, or, or approaching him for something, and you feel like you have no respect for him. You know what I'm talking about? And what parent do you know? Well, we do know some. But what reasonable parent, what parent with some type of tangible bit of intelligence will suffer a child that has no respect for him? He ain't gonna lay alone. But back to Colossians 1 and 10. He said, giving thanks unto the Father which has made us meet to be partakers of the inheritance of saints in life. So he said, it, it, it was, he made us inheritance of the Father of saints in life. 
Now we know Yahshua is the light in the word, and he's already told us that the inheritance is with those who are sanctified by the faith that is in him. He said, who have delivered us from the power of darkness and has translated us into the kingdom of his dear son. So he has translated us from the prince of the power of the air, or from the prince of darkness, the rule of darkness, the rule of sin, the devil, from transgression. He done delivered us from his, from his own blood. He done purchased us with it. And he said, in whom we have redemption through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins, who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So we already know, we've established that, that he from the beginning, right? Say he's the firstborn of every creature. And remember this key part where he said, he said he is in the image of the invisible God. I want that to be in your brain. It said, Paul is testifying, this man is in the image of the invisible God. Let's go on with it. He said, For by him were all things created that are in heaven, that are in earth, visible and invisible, whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or power. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things, and by him all things consist. So now we can see why, why Paul and John, we have already established this in the scriptures, right? Why Paul and John are saying what they're saying, right? We've seen this clearly. This man is before everything. You know what I'm talking about? And that he made everything, and that everything was made for him because the whole book is about him, because he was set up to rule the whole earth from the beginning because he was slain from the foundation of the world. And this is what he says. For please, and he said, verse 18. And he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. And this is what people didn't understand. This is why he was they didn't understand. This man got to be top rank in everything. Can't nobody have a better or higher position than him in any matter. But let's go to Daniel 7 and 9, because it's going to tie back to the cloud. That tied back to the light. That tied back to him making everything. But let's look at how he say he is the image of the invisible God. Daniel 7 and 9. Daniel 7 and 9. There is Daniel. Listen to what the book says. Daniel 7 and 9. He says, I beheld till thrones were cast down, and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheel as burning fire. Now he said this man hair was like, like wool, wasn't it? Let's see if we can get some other witnesses to point it out. Look at Ezekiel 40 and about verse 3. See if we can get a couple more witnesses on this. Let's just look at Ezekiel 40 and 3. Let's see. Verse 3. And he brought me thither, and behold, there was a man whose appearance was like the appearance of brass, with a line of flax in his hand and a measuring reed, and he stood in the gate. So this man said this man's appearance is like brass, right? Say his skin like brass. Hold Daniel 7, but look at Daniel 10. Verse 5. Then I lift up my eyes and looked, and behold, a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded up with fine gold of you fast. His body was also like the barrel. His face as the appearance of lightning. Now we've already seen, right, that he say, let there be light. And we've established that. Hold that. Look at Malachi 4 and 2. Because it said the man's face like light. Meaning shining. Guess who also came all shining and he had to put a veil over his face? Moses came off the mountain shining. So again, what that's pointing to? You've got to see it. You can't see it. There's a problem. Malachi 4 and 2. This is what he said. But unto you that fear my name shall the Son of Righteousness arise with healing in his wings, and ye shall go forth and grow up as calves of the stall. And ye shall tread down the wicked, for they shall be ashes under the soles of your feet in the day that I shall do this, save y'all hope. So that's going back to Revelation 1, really not. Say everybody going to sin, and he's going to bust them down. He said the Son of Righteousness. Look at Zechariah 14 and 6. And he said the man, and he's already said the man faith like lightning. Zechariah 14 and 6. He's right there by Malachi, you ain't even got to go for it. He's saying, it shall come to pass in that day that the light shall not be clear nor dark, but it shall be in one day which shall be known to y'all. Did he tell his disciples when they asked him when he will restore the kingdom? He said, it's not for you to know this. Same thing he told you in Matthew 24, don't nobody know this day but the Father. Not day nor night, but it shall come to pass that at evening time it shall be light. Ain't that the same thing happened in the beginning of creation? It was darkness, and he said, let there be light. 
So in the darkness of the midst of the sin of the world, light going to come and expose and make everything manifest. You know what I'm talking about? And there'll be nowhere to hide, nowhere to run. Going back to that thing. Going back to that thing. Did I finish reading all of that thing? I don't think so. Let me attempt that. I don't think I did. No, he said his eyes were as lamps of fire. You know what it is. We're going to read it again. But what do you say in Genesis 49 and 11? His eyes shall be red with wine. That's what he said. And he said his arms and his feet like in color to polished grass, grass and the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. This is what Daniel testified. So this man's voice sounded like a whole gang of people. But look at Proverbs 16 and 15. Because it said this man's face is like light. That's what the book is telling us. We're going to see. Proverbs 16 and 15 says this, And the light of the king's countenance is life. So it's saying the light of the king's face is life. Who is the king? We've read who the king is. And he's saying his favor is as the cloud of light of rain. And what does favor signify? Gifts, right? He came and gave gifts unto men. So his favor, the Holy Ghost, is like the light of rain. I'm going to rain it down. Did he not rain it down at Pentecost? Did he not rain it down with Elisha? Come on now, work with me. Look at Revelation 1, because it says he in the image of the invisible God. Ancient of days, they're talking about the Father. So when we look at Revelation 1, let's say verse 13. We'll do verse 13. This is what it says. And then, in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one light unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and girt about the path with a golden girdle, his head and his hair were like the white of wool and white as snow, and his eyes were as flames of fire. And it did not, not say that, is it, that that's exactly how the Father was looking. Then it says, his feet like undefined brass, testifying what Ezekiel saw, is right or wrong. What Daniel seen, and he said, as if they were burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Again, tying into what Daniel, Daniel said, it was a multitude. John said, it's not lie. Either way. Because when we say he's going to give a great what? Shot. And everybody in the grave going in. So this is why his voice loud. Listen to this here though. He said he had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth a sharp two-edged sword. Remember Isaiah 49 and 2 said he made my tongue like a sword. This is what he said. And his countenance was as the sun shine in his strength. And that's not kind in the what? Not a kind. Proverbs 16. You know what I'm talking about? All these things tied in together about who this is talking about. So let's go back to Daniel 7. Because you know every time it mentioned about an angel, they were right. It's with, what, with Paul, what happened to Paul when he seen it? He was blinded. He said it was a great light. He said I couldn't even see no more. Let's see that there so they just don't think I'm talking. I know everybody knows they know the story. Let's just make sure they just think I ain't talking. We find out that's where Paul at. Acts 9, verse 1. And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of him to Damascus, to the synagogue, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came to Damascus, and suddenly there shone round about him a light from heaven. Huh? The light from heaven, which is Yahshua, which is going to came to do what? Because we mentioned that daughter. We're going to get back to Daniel 7 and 9. Look at Isaiah 9. Because he came to do something. This showing forth the thing that was in creation. Daniel 9, verse 2. Huh? I mean, I mean Isaiah. Isaiah 9, verse 2. He said, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. And so, didn't he say he translated us from darkness to be partakers of the saints and light in the dear kingdom by his son? He said we were walking in the darkness. We, could see, we couldn't see where we were going. Because he said that any man walk in the night, they walk in darkness and he stumble not. He don't know where he's going. But he said if any man walk in the light, he see where he's going. You walking in the word, you walking in Yahshua, you can see where you're going. He said and that, they, that they that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them have the light shine. You know what I'm talking about? Then he say, "What? Well, look at Psalm 23. Everybody know it. They say, don't nobody don't know nothing else in this book. They know that. 
Paul beside John 3 and 16. No, I don't know. Everybody might not know that. Verse 4. Matter of fact, verse 2. Verse 1. Y'all is my shepherd, I shall not want. We all know from Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 34, John 10, y'all too is the shepherd. I'm talking about number 27. Ecclesiastes 12. He said he make me lie to lie down in green pastures. He said I'm going to make my people lie down they're going to be safe. So where them green pastures at? In the land that flow with milk and honey in, in Israel. He said he lead me beside the still waters. He lead me behind what he said. I'm going to lead those I have mercy upon by the springs of water. The Holy Ghost. He restore my soul. Huh? He give us life. He lead me in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. He lead me in the way of holiness for y'all sure name's sake. He's the way the truth and the life. He said, Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff comfort me. So what is that rod? The rod of correction. Blessed is the man whom thou chasten out of thy law. Tell you, he say, what he say? Despise not the chastening of Yah, for whom Yah loves thee chasten as a father, chasten his son, whom he does like. So of course you're going to be comforted by the correction of God. It's going to keep you in the way. It's going to lead you to what? God is sorrow, which is not to be repented of, which work upon the sovereigns. You understand? Let's go back to this, Daniel. And we got to finish uh, John 19, with will commit, and Romans 8. And we probably finish this all night. We're going to hold y'all much longer. It's all good. Daniel 7, who was that? Verse 9, verse 10, I should read. A fiery stream. You know, we're not going to read verse 10 because that's a whole other matter. Verse 13. I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven. And came to the ancient of days, and they brought him here before him, and there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. Which is going back to what we read in Micah. You know what I'm saying? So you see in all this thing, he coming on the clouds of heaven. We know from Matthew 26, the high priest say, are you the Messiah, the Son of God? Tell us plainly. Matter of fact, we'll read it. We'll just read it because it tied back into him ascending on high. 26 and 63. Okay. Right. But y'all sure here. Oh, yeah, that's even better. Back it up to 62. We'll deal with the temple of God next week, Lord willing. We ain't going to be able to fit it in with and make it make all sense. And the high priest arose and said unto him, Answer thou nothing? What is it which these witnesses against thee? But Yahshua held his peace. Now you know how you say he held his peace? You know the scripture testified this, right? Let's look at Psalms 38 and 13 and Psalms 39 and 9. Psalms 38 and 13. But as a deaf man heard not, and I was a dumb man that opened not his mouth. Remember the other one, uh, he said, he said something to him, but it's not far from him. He like to say, he said, if I speak, if I do evil, then okay. But if not, what you hit me for? You know what I'm talking about? Because they said a lot of things, he just stood there quiet. Pilate like this, he said, don't you know I got power over you? He said, you ain't got power over nothing unless it be given unto you from heaven. You ain't got no power over me. Look at Psalm 39 and 9. He said, I was dumb. I opened not my mouth because thou did it. Now, how, now who is David talking about? Talking about he was dumb. He ain't opened his mouth because he did. Now, where can we read this in the book where somebody was dumb and didn't open their mouth? Who he's mimicking? You know what I'm saying? Y'all sure hadn't came yet. So, who is he talking about if he ain't talking about the mouth? Because the master is doing this, ain't he? This man said, you ain't going to say nothing. But look what he said when he did open his mouth. Go back to Matthew 26. Look what he said when he did open his mouth. He said, But Yahshua held his peace, and the high priest answered and said unto him, I adjure thee by the living God, that thou tell us whether thou be the Messiah, the Son of God. Yahshua said unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power coming in the clouds of heaven. You see all these things tying together, which is going back to what? With Elijah. You know what I'm talking about? Coming in the key, was taken away in the cloud of heaven. And I said, I'll come back in the cloud of heaven. But let's go back to Romans 8. And all these things, just to show this key thing, that in him we have life. In him we have peace. We must dwell in him. And that he is the light. And hold on, oh boy, you got one more spot for that too. 
Well, we stopped that by verse 8. No, we was in verse 7. Say, but because the carnal mind is enmity against God, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. So if you're carnally minded, how are you going to be able to please Him? Because you're not going to do the things that He minds and that's pleasurable to Him. You're going to do the things that are pleasurable to you. Verse 10. No, verse 9. No, verse 9. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of the Messiah, he is none of his. So you know you can't be a son of God if you have not Yah dwelling amongst you and he's not in, and you not dwelling in him and he dwelling in you. That he has not set his tabernacle amongst you. Because if his tabernacle is not dwelling in you, then guess what that means? God hates you. Because he says, I will not abhor you if you do what I say. I'll set my sanctuary in the midst of you and I'll dwell in you. But nevertheless, he say, uh, if the Messiah be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Yahshua from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up the Messiah from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwell in you. So he's telling you he's going to make you alive, which is that word of life, what we bear witness to, right? So we got to, so what does that mean? We've got to receive the gift that he's given unto me. This is, a, this is essential for us. This is vital for us. And the only way we can know to receive it is what? Not only just the obedience to the word, but believing the word. You know what I'm talking about? Because when we believe the word, we can see the man clearly and see the works that he came to manifest. So like I say, it's many things that we've been seeing over the last few weeks. You're like, oh, we thought this was this here, but it was him. You know what I'm talking about? Like I said, man, many times, you look at that story with Elijah and Alicia, you just thinking that's just a story about Elijah and Alicia. You know what I'm talking about? But then we're not even seeing that the same thing in the same. I'm talking about step for step, blow for blow. That the high went down with the apostles, it went down with them. Alicia was chosen, the apostles were chosen. You know what I'm talking about? The apostles seen him taken away, Alicia seen him taken away. The master left on a cloud, Alicia, uh, Elijah left on a cloud. Elijah gave him a spirit, the master gave him a spirit. You know what I'm talking about? All these takes to find out what the man said, the law giving a shadow of better things to come. You know what I'm talking about? That's a beautiful thing. That's a merciful God. you got to give us an inkling to see these things. You know what I'm saying? That's why they say, well, the prophets look into this here. They want to see. So this is what, why we had this going on like this. This is why this happened like this. This is why. You know what I'm saying? That's a beautiful thing. That's when he say the mystery of God in this is not been made manifest. It's a mystery to people. They don't understand it. That's why he say it's foolishness to a natural man. You know what I'm talking about? But to a spiritual man, it all makes sense. And it rejoices the soul. But nevertheless, we'll end this all... We're going to take up no more this morning, y'all. It's already out of there. Isaiah, I mean, Psalm 43 and 2. Psalm 43 and 3. Look at verse 1, though. It's going to tie back again and again to the master. That's a beautiful thing that we've been dealing with this here because we know as we get closer to the path, oh, we're going to deal a lot about, about his death. You know what I'm talking about? In his resurrection, we're going to be dealing with a lot of those things. You know what I'm saying? And showing forth the manifestation of it. We saw a couple things tonight, did we not? We're going to see one more thing before we get up out of here. Judge me, O oh God, and plead my cause against the ungodly nation. Is that not what happened? Did he say, judge me, O God? Did he say he put his trust in he that judges righteously against the ungodly nation? Because then the people say, give us the murderer. We want the ravish. Let his blood be upon our children's children. You know what I'm talking about? That's the ungodly nation. Did he say, since you rejected the headstone, that the, that, that, that the headstone of the corner, did he say, I'll take the kingdom from you and give it to a nation that's bringing forth the fruit thereof? Listen to him now. Oh, deliver me from the deceitful and unjust men. Did they not bear false witness on the man? Did they not lie on the man? Did they bring up many, did they say they brought up many false witnesses? None of them met in agreement. He said, for thou art the God of my strength. Why does thou cast me off? What he said in Psalm 22 and 1. And then he also said, he just, I'm not going to say it in, in Aramaic. He said, but my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He said, why go I mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? O oh, send out thy light and thy truth. Let them lead me. Let them bring me unto thy holy hill and to thy tabernacle. He said, send out the light and the truth. Ain't he the truth and the light? But hold on, look at something. He said, send out and lead me to your holy hill. Look at Psalm 24. Look at Psalm 24. 
We can read Psalm 15 too. They both say the same thing. Verse 1. Well, actually, verse uh, verse 3. Who shall ascend into the hill of God? Who shall stand in his holy place? He that hath clean hands and a pure heart, who have not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor swore deceitfully. Look at uh, Hebrews 7. Because he said, who's going to sit up into his holy hill? And it says, Wherefore he is able also to save them that uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever lived to make intercession for them. For such a high priest become us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, made higher than the heavens. Who need not daily of those high priests to offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people. For he did this once when he offered up himself. For the law make him high, make men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath which was sent to the law makes the son who is consecrated forevermore. And remember what he said? This day I declare the decree, thou art my son, I have begotten thee. He said, I have sworn and shall not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So he said, this before the law was given, he just swore an oath, I'm going to do this. Because all David was getting was a vision of what had already been spoken. You know what I'm talking about? This man had already said this in the heavens. How we know this? The lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Look at Psalm 15. He said, send out your light and your truth so it can bring you in a tabernacle, right? That's what he said, right? Mm -hmm. All right, look at Psalm 15, and we'll go to John 14, and we'll call it a night. I mean, yeah, Psalm 15 and 1. He says, Yah, who shall abide in thy tabernacle? Who shall dwell in thy holy hill? He that walk uprightly and work righteousness and speak truth in his heart. That's what he said. Look at Isaiah 33 and about verse 14. He said, he that walketh uprightly. Speak truth in his heart. Got the word of God in his heart. Got Yahshua in his heart. Ain't that what he's talking about? I say about verse 14. We're going to verse 15. He said, he that walk righteously and speak uprightly. He that despise the gain of oppression. That shake his hand from holding of bribes that stop his ears from hearing of blood and shut his eyes from seeing evil, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munition of rocks. Bread shall be given him. His water shall be sure. He said bread going to be given him. The lamb going to be given him. The word going to be given him. His water is going to be sure. He's going to have the Holy Ghost. And guess what happens when you have that? Thy eyes shall see the king in his beauty, and they shall behold the land that is very far off. Because what he said, everybody that's written in Jerusalem shall be holy. That's what he said in Isaiah 4, isn't it? Didn't he say in Revelation 21 and 27, nothing abominable or defiled shall enter into the city, only those that's written in the Lamb's Book of Life. So if you live in the Lamb's Book of Life, what you done to it? You got rivers of uh, living water flowing out your belly, and you done ate that bread. You done ate this bread. He said, my flesh is meat indeed. He said, I'm the bread of life, which comes down from heaven. Back to Psalm 15. He says, verse 3. He that back not, he that back by not with his tongue, nor do evil to his neighbor, nor take a reproach up against his neighbor. Which is going back to what? Don't be a talebearer, which is in the law, which is bear not a grudge against the children of thy people. Love your neighbors, you love yourself. He said, in whom I, the vile person, is contempt. Going back to what? What David said in Psalm 101. I ain't even gonna know a wicked person. He said, what? Blessed is the man that go not, who does not take the counsel of the ungodly, nor walk in the way of sinners, nor sit in the seat of, of, of scorns. He said, but he honor them that fear Yah, he that swear to his own hurt, and change not. So just like God don't change, you don't change either. You're going to be consistent, right? And if man say, you honor them that fear Yah, which goes back to 1 John 5. We know we love God and we love the children of God and keep his commandments, right? And he said, he put not out his money to earthly, nor take reward against the innocent. He that do these things shall never be moved. So he said, he that do these things shall never be moved. Look at Psalm 125. We're going to get to this John 14 in a minute. Look at Psalm 125. Maybe it's 126. But he said, you'll never be moved. Yeah, Psalm 125. They that trust in Yah shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abide forever. 
as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so is Yah round about his people from henceforth even forever. So look at Matthew 7 and 23. Because he said you ain't going to be moved. Now why you ain't going to be moved? Lord permit we'll deal with it next week because you're going to have a solid foundation. Verse 24 actually. Therefore, whosoever hear these things, these things of mine and do them, I will liken him unto a rise man which built his house upon a rock. And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not because it was founded upon a rock. Which means what? That house couldn't be moved. Because you built your holy tabernacle or your body on the chief cornerstone and made a pillar in the house of God which cannot be moved. Hebrew 12. Huh? I ain't got nothing. Hebrews 12 and about verse 25. It says, See ye, see that ye refuse not him that speak. But for if they escape not who refuse him that speak on earth, much more shall we not escape if we turn away from him that speak from heaven whose voice then shook the earth, but now he had promised, saying, Yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. That's what he quoted Haggai the second chapter. And this word, yet once more, signify the removing of those things that are shaken, as of those things that are made, that those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Wherefore we receive in the kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace, whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. For our God is a consuming fire. So when this man says he's going to shake these things, anything that's not of God ain't going to be moved. Because he said in the next verse after that in Matthew, he said, but any man don't hear my saying, I like him to a man who built his house on sand. You know what I'm talking about? And when the rain come and the wind blew, he said that house fall and great is the fall of it. Because it ain't founded on nothing. It ain't rooted on nothing. But when you trust in God and you rooted on the word, how can you be moved? No, can you be moved? Let's look at Psalm 27 and 1. Let's see. The man say, because it's the whole key point of it. Because you got to remember this. It's another spot where you say, I ain't going to be moved. You ain't going to be moved when you're standing on the rock. And we ain't talking about for this either. Look at verse 27 and 1. That's all we want. He said, Y'all is my life and my salvation. Huh? So he's sitting here telling you. Yahshua is my life and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Yah is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? John 14 and 1. Let me call it a night. Man say, if, this, if you standing on the rock, if Yah is your light and your salvation, who's going to make you afraid? Who's going to move you? You found it on sun. And people ain't found it on nothing. They ain't walking in the world, is it? They walking on sand. Quit saying that. Thing. John 14 and 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Ain't that what he was just saying in Psalm 27? Don't let your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe in me, because I come from him. And in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. And whether I go, ye know, and the way ye know. Hold on, John 12, one more, and one more five. John 12 and 27. We're ending with this. Verse 26, I should say. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, him my father will honor. Hallelujah for y'all so and blessed to the Father in the name of y'all so for his word and his holy Sabbath. Y'all got any questions? Y'all understood all these things? Okay. I love you.